Havana, Cuba. On a sunny day, children swim below the seawall. The island's warmth and beauty have captivated visitors for centuries. But like these classic cars, most of what you see today predates Castro's 1959 revolution. Like the ailing Castro, most of Havana is in decay. I came to Cuba to talk to this woman, Ioani Sanchez. She left Cuba a few years ago, but returned and now writes about the island. For seven months, she has published an often highly critical blog about daily life in Cuba. It's called Generation Y. Incredibly, she signs her name to every word and even posts a photo of herself on her website. In Castro's Cuba, that means running the risk of a long jail sentence, or worse. When I visited, she was writing the title to her latest entry about how paranoia paralyzes the island. It's a post about the interior paranoia that we all have that makes us suspicious of everyone, that anyone we know could be a member of the secret police or of the CIA. To get around restrictions on internet access, Ioani bluffs her way into internet cafes in tourist hotels that normally bar Cubans from entering. Cubans aren't allowed to have internet at home, and public internet access available to Cubans is too slow to manage a blog. Her writing has become important for people trying to understand Cuba in Castro's twilight years. In October, the blog had half a million hits. Her readers are mainly outside of Cuba, from Miami and Washington, D.C. to Caracas and Buenos Aires. On a drizzly day, Ioani took me to see Havana, our first stop, the Monument to the Revolution. We are looking at the center of power and the historical place for mass gatherings of the people. She took me to a market near her home. She gets inspiration from the things she sees in her daily life, like this man cutting up yuca, Cuba's answer to the potato. She stopped at a stall selling used books. In the early 1990s, her university thesis on dictators in Latin American literature scandalized the faculty. Her academic career ended before it began, prompting her to leave Cuba. We headed for Old Havana, near where she grew up. Drying clothes are visible in these crumbling homes, proof people still live inside the husks. This is the best example of how things function in reality, despite the political propaganda. The houses of the city speak for themselves. This is a butcher shop. It's closed for siesta, but it's never very busy. Normally, all they sell are rationed eggs once per month. Beef for people who are sick or pregnant. Chicken and fish for the population also rationed. Rationing of beef normally is for people with health problems and pregnant women. For the general population, what we have is a quota of chicken and sometimes fish. As dusk approached, I became more and more curious about this woman. I wanted to know what motivated her to write. I think that each Cuban can do something to change things that they don't like, some with more intensity and others with less. One of the first things that we have to do, a great way to begin, is to be more honest about saying what one thinks. The exercise of saying what one thinks is something that liberates you and helps you start opening up new doors. It takes you on the path toward action, to say what one thinks, to try to act as though you were free, even though there are political and legal structures that are telling you that is not true. You don't let it bother you. You believe that you are free and try to act like it. Little by little, this can be contagious for others. The Wall Street Journal in Havana, Cuba.